This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Five. Check for sound. Four. It's showtime. Three. Let's two, go. One. Thanks to Rode Microphones and Harlan Hogan's VoiceOverEssentials.com. The home of the Portable Pro. This is the Pro Audio Suite podcast with Robert Marshall from Source Elements and Someone Audio Post Chicago. Darren Robbo Robertson from Voodoo Radio Imaging Sydney. From LA, George the Tech Whitten, the Tech to the VO Stars. And me, Andrew Peters, voiceover talent and home studio guy. Thanks to Rode Microphones and Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials, the home of the Booth Pro. We're back for another show and we have a guest we've talked to before, but we've got him back. It is the one and only Nick Tate. How are you, Nick? Oh, I'm fabulous. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. you know, but it really doesn't matter how I am. It's how I sound that counts, isn't it? Yeah, That's I'm what we always say. Broad you've still got a head, you can exactly. still work. Exactly. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I there was a guy over here that I... Uh, you, admired greatly and I can't remember his name now but I, I met him in New York he had, and he had a fabulous voice the minute I heard him but he was in a wheelchair so lots of people um, managed to do this career without legs and arms and shoulders yeah absolutely he's got a voice and I, uh, we have a client who does it without eyes so how do you deliver the script to them you know what? I, I think he memorizes it, I, I believe. Yeah, I've, I've sometimes done that, you know, practicing my American accent. I, I, uh, I, I'm watching somebody working and I just repeat everything they say. Uh, at least that's what I used to do. Yeah. I've been here for 30 years now, so if I can't do it, I should go home. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, it's interesting because uh, anyone that knows you would know of you in the uh, Five Guys in a Limo video, which seems to um, do its circling around the industry and everybody's kind of It will live on. It's strange because uh, dear Don is dead uh, and he was he was the most extraordinary human being. He was this guy that, that was driving around in this huge limo and when I first heard about it, I thought, what a wanker. Right, yeah. of course. <laughs> but... but you know, uh, when I started working and I was doing two or three sessions a day, I was getting pretty tired from all the driving around. And then I started to do five and six sessions a day and then eight and nine. And I think my record was 11 sessions in one day. But And you travel from Burbank to Santa Monica, back out to Paramount Studios and over to MGM, wherever you're going. And you're driving all the time. I felt like a courier for my voice. Yeah. You know, and there was no time to have any proper sit downs with lunch. So... I didn't really drink coffee, but I became very familiar with Starbucks. And in the end, I, I'd, I'd arrive home and I was good. I was just so, so jittery from all the coffee <laughs> I'd had. But uh, one time, Don, uh, who was with my agent, Steve Tishman, he said to me one day, um, would, you, would you like to come around with me uh, one day? So I said, uh, well, it's sitting in your big limo. And I was being a bit kind of you know, bolshy by saying it like that. And he said, yeah, sure. And then I realized the guy went to 25 locations in one day. He needed the limo. He needed the driver. Don would just sit there and he'd get taken. Producers used to line up at the studios that he was at, uh, opposing producers, because if you wanted him and you had to have him, you'd go to somebody else's studio and he'd give five minutes to this guy and five minutes to that guy. And they're all lining up to work with Don and, until he got his own fiber optic studio in his own house. And because of Don setting up a home studio, he was one of the the pioneers of the home studio. He most certainly was, yeah. How are you finding it that now we're uh, all in lockdown? Well, I got kind of used to working in a booth here in my own home because, as I said, when I was getting up around about eight, and nine, ten voiceovers a day, and then I got uh, Fox on air as well, where I was doing Ally McBeal and Futurama and a whole host of Fox television shows, they would try and get me towards the end of the afternoon because I'd be doing all the movie trailers throughout the middle of the day. And and then I'd go home at about six o'clock and, God, I, I hadn't been home 20 minutes. They'd ring me and say they want to fix on something. I'd have to drive back to Fox. Yeah. And um, Joe Cipriano, another guy that was working on Fox all the time, lovely, mm -hmm. lovely, yeah. very talented voice of a man here. He said to me, Nick, why don't you get ISDN? I mean, I'm going right back to sort of like 1995, 96, somewhere around there. Forget. 
And uh, he had a te good technician, came along to my house, and he said, yeah, and this is the booth I'm sitting in right now. Um, I'm underneath the stairs in the middle of the, the house, and it's got all the Sonics rubber all, all, all over it. And, uh, and I started doing those voiceovers for Fox that way because I'd come, I'd say to them, okay, guys, I'm going home now. If you want me, you can use me on ISDN from my own booth. Oh, you've got a booth now, have you? I said, yeah, well, I have to. I'm going to drive them backwards and forwards all the time. And in the beginning, it was like pioneer stuff, just two or three of us. or maybe No, there might have been about 10, <laughs> I suppose, had booths. But you had to be working a lot for, for the booth to be worth its weight in gold yeah. uh, and with your good ISDN machine and so forth. Um, and, and then, of course, when I started traveling back to Australia more, I really needed... I, I wanted to become not reliant on the studios anymore. I wanted them to think of me only as an ISDN voice. That way I could be anywhere in the world, and, and it worked for a while. I, I came back to Sydney uh, after 9-11, and they all had my phone number and address, and those kind of movie trailers start around about 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, and there's a lot of work going in the morning before the afternoon sets in. And so that, of course, is 10 o'clock in the morning in in uh, in L.A. is like 3.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning in Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> and the phone would ring at 3 o'clock in the morning. Hey, Nick, yo, what are you doing? You have the Bundy Beach? I'd say, no, actually, I was asleep. Oh, my God, what time is it? I'd say, 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, Christ, well, we, sorry, ma'am, we have to do this. Well, I, I knew that. I knew they had to do it, and that's why I put the ISDN in. Yeah. But... Uh, some very funny things happening, you know. I, I would say, could you just wait five minutes while I make a cup of coffee so I can wake up? Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny now because everybody is set up at home because they have to be, and uh, hopefully it will uh, remain this way so we get out of our cars and can work without burning a hole in the ozone layer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, so I, you know, we've become very used to being at home in our booths. And to that extent, not a lot's changed in terms of the way we work. But the world outside of our booths has changed greatly. Yeah. You walk outside and people everywhere with masks on. Here's a question for you, which, um, you know, you don't have to answer if you don't wish to, Nick. But uh, we do know you have uh, a birthday on the way. Do you find now we're using more technology to deliver voiceover that people are slightly ageist and wouldn't be capable of making a connection technically. <laughs> well, I just talk to uh, to George about whether I can make a connection or not. I, I can't. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it took me 20 minutes to hook up with you guys. But the thing is that now with IPDDL and Source Connect and these things, as, as was rightly pointed out to me, Nick, we sent you the link. All you've got to do is click on the link and boom, there you are. And of course, when I did, it worked. But although I used to have Chrome on my computer, um, my son, who he's the tech whiz in our family, and he's now forty. He comes into the house and he changes everything on my. Dad, I want to go. There, you fixed now. I said, "What did you do?" He said, "Doesn't matter. Everything's fine." And then I don't know what I'm doing on my computer. Right. <laughs> or he gives me a new one. And the other day, I, he, he snatched my iPhone Seven out of my hands and said, "That's archaic." And he gave me his iPhone Eleven, which he'd traded up for some other one that's even newer than that. And I cannot work this friggin' thing. It's just, mm. um, it's, uh, so how do I handle the modern age? I hope that people dial me mostly. Yeah. And uh, I used to work a lot on Dropbox. Uh, yeah. When people wanted me, I'd record everything on Dropbox and send it to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite good at that. Yeah. But I'm learning new systems. Um, when you say age, are they ageist? I, I think you're referring to the fact that uh, People of my age are, are not technically able. Uh, I've met some guys that are, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> um, I just hope they call me, and, and they, they do with yeah. monotonous regularity, thank God, because um, voiceovers is uh, it's money for old rope, really, isn't it? It's a very difficult art form. Yes, extremely. <laughs> that very few people can get their head around. You lead me to a question that I, I was thinking about when – Nick was talking about his age. I mean, you, you have been in the industry for a long time. Oh, well, well yeah. Um, I went to England um, in 1965, where a whole new era of, of, for me, British television, which was superb, 
BBC in the big round building there. But, and, but lots of um, pirate radio, which was supposedly done out of ships in, out at sea. But some of the pirate radio was actually done right in the heart of London in secret places. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the authorities really knew that was what was going on. And I started getting commercials uh, in, in Britain and I was living in Wandsworth and I used to get on my little bike and ride it into the city, uh, into Soho, where the studios were doing voiceovers there. And uh, I kind of learnt my voiceover career in England. Um, yeah. uh, and I think I really honed my craft in Australia. Yeah. Australia's always been a, a, a kind of like a champion for me by way of, uh, of film and television and, and radio. Um, so innovative and, and different. We, mm. yeah, we, we did have to learn from other countries, but in the end, we went our own way with our own style. And now, of course, the Australian actor, and I mean women and men, uh, including the voice people as well, are kind of like pioneers in the world. Uh, you, you watch the Oscars here, and half the people st being nominated are, are either from Australia or England. Mm -hmm. Only yeah. about one third of them are from America. Mm, it's true. And the American actors are pretty bombed out about it. They sometimes get quite upset when you're at an audition. They say, what the hell are you doing here? Why don't you go back and work in your own country? You know, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you guys come and steal all our work from us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, well, you can go to Australia and try and steal the work out there, mate, but you'll find the competition pretty tough. Yeah. Yeah. Just quickly, just sorry, AP, just to follow on, just one follow on question from that. Does Nick Tate have an alter ego when he steps behind the microphone? The ignominity of, of, the, of the microphone, in other words, I, I could be doing it in my underpants. Nobody would know. In fact, mm. I have mm. done. Mm. Um, <laughs> and so the, there's that blessing that um, you can become another character by your voice, different accents and all sorts of stuff. It's far more difficult on camera or in, on the stage to do it because you have to be dressed appropriately uh, and you have to look like that character. I always remember my mother, she, she did a radio series called um, Hell Hath No Fury Like a Woman Scorned. It was called A Woman Scorned, but it comes from that expression, Hell Hath No Fury Like a Woman Scorned, um, where a very beautiful woman is taken by her kind of avaricious and, and jealous husband to Africa uh, and uh, she gets eaten. Well, in the story, she gets eaten by a lion, uh, but and he leaves her for dead. And, and she's very rich, and he comes home with all her money. And the person that finds her happens to be a uh, a plastic surgeon doctor, and uh, he spends about three years putting her back together and takes this rather dumpy, plain-looking woman and turns her into a raving beauty. And so the whole story is about how she comes back to town and. Uh, into the city and makes him fall. Doesn't, he doesn't know who she is. And, he, and she makes him fall in love with her all over again. And then she reveals who she is and he gets appropriately escorted off by the authorities. Um, well, my mother played that role on radio. And um, I know that it sounds a fairly obvious thing to do, but everybody was astounded by the fact that my mother, who was a very trim, good-looking young woman, could sound like this big fat woman when she was talking, you know, with a same strange kind of an accent, which she then changed when she became the beautiful girl again. Well, I see now I made it all sound ridiculous. She made it work. And I, I think the best actors do. Uh, and it's not, it's not just with how, how they dress. I mean, Russell Crowe has got a fabulous voice. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not talking singing voice, a pretty shitty singing voice. But he has a wonderful voice. And a lot, uh, see, I've never understood quite why Michael Caine was as famous as he is because his voice is awful. <laughs> Richard Burton, I mean, just had, he probably had the best voice on the planet. And I, and I think that uh, Anthony Hopkins uh, uh, probably is as good as he is or was. Uh, uh, the other thing about uh, Anthony Hopkins is he's a brilliant mimic and he can do Richard Burton to a T. Yes, he but, can. Well, they're both Welsh. <laughs> yes, but, but you know, that, that ability to change your voice... Uh, I, I think that more often than not, that the actors that we like the most, with the exception of Michael Caine, uh, do have great <laughs> instruments. It mightn't be beautiful, but it's just got a quality that, that really, it, it makes them the complete, you know, what's the whole nine yards, as they say. It's not just their looks. 
So how did you start learning the art of voiceover? I used to have a little Grundig uh, reel-to-reel tape recorder because uh, people have often asked me, someone just yesterday, about you know, how, how do you learn to become a voiceover guy? I said, well, you copy. You listen to other people. You listen to the people that are doing it and that they're successful. And if you happen to have the kind of voice where you can mimic them, then in the beginning, do. Uh, and then later on, of course, you must make it your own. Uh, but you will develop that. And uh, people say, well, you know, don't you have to have a fabulous voice? Well, you, you do have to have a good voice. But there are three things I always tell people. First off is that you've got to have a voice that's interesting, that people, it doesn't have to be fabulous, it's just got to be interesting and people uh, want to hear it or are kind of interested in hearing it. That's one thing you must have. The second thing you've got to be able to do is you have to take a piece of copy, which uh, generally is a 30-second commercial. You've got to be able to read it in 28 and a half seconds exactly and uh, it's usually written in 35 seconds. So you're going to make 35 seconds in 28 and a half seconds and make it sound like you're not hurrying. Yeah. And then the third thing is that you've got to be able to say the, the product name without stumbling over it. And some of the key words in the commercial, like brilliant or tasteful or, or strong or better, all these little words that are describing what it is you're advertising, but not make it sound like you're pointing them out. And yeah. having said all that, if you can do that, you'll probably get a career in voiceovers. Do you think you're a, a, a really good mimic? Who, me? Yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm, I, I do accents, but no. Um, I, I quite often get asked to do Liam Neeson. Um, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, I guess there's a kind of a, a vocal quality that's a little similar to Liam Neeson. But I, I'm not, I never have been a mimic in that sense. Uh, I, as a child or as a young man, when other people were listening to the Beatles and Elvis Presley and so on in my era, I had all Peter Sellers records, best of Sellers songs for swinging Sellers, and I was learning all the British dialects and everything, or a la as Peter Sellers. And uh, a major some rotten iron stole the strings off my guitar. How many <laughs> times do I have to tell you? The whole point's away from you. Oh, so much to learn, so little time. <laughs> yeah, that sort of stuff, you know, uh, all, all his accents. And so when I got to England... Uh, I was already on the way to having kind of like a comedic English accents, British accents, Irish, Welsh. I used to go uh, on the train. I, I got a job uh, one particular time where I had to do a Mancunian accent and I had no idea what it was. So I got on the train in London and half an hour later I was in Manchester, the speed train, and I spent uh, three or four nights there going to the pubs and talking to people and, and trying to pick up the dialect, you know. And there are so many different dialects in England, all over the place. It's staggering how many different dialects there are. Oh, yeah. But I lived in England for nearly 25 years, so I didn't learn them all uh, straight off. They just slowly came to me. It's like the United States, the, you know, the range of dialects here, but just condensed into a much, much tinier yeah. geographical area. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to travel far in the UK to, to hit another accent. Uh, now, changing the subject, um, just give us a bit of an idea of what kind of voiceover work you've done. Yeah, I've done all kinds of voiceover work, really. Uh, in Australia, I think I did more um, commercials. Uh, eventually, when I came back in or between uh, 69 and 73 with Paul, what's his name? Very funny, clever guy. He had a, a studio called Hello Testing. And I did a lot of work for him because he was a great talent. And he used Jim Pike a lot. So uh, Jim and I would often work together or move in and out of the studio having just swapped seats. Uh, and yeah. then I went back to um, England again and, and worked more over there and did quite a lot of work, as I told you, on, uh, on, on Capital Radio and some of the, uh, the pirate uh, radio stations that were, had ships at sea. And we were we were doing yeah. those commercials. So I, I'd wanted to get work in America. And after I did Space 1999, I was actually asked to go and work there. But I just got married to Hazel. And I didn't want to leave England. My career in England was really cooking. And I thought that the American people, if they really wanted me, they'd send for me. I thought Space 1999 would do it. I was being asked to science fiction conventions. So why wouldn't they bring me over as an actor? But they never did. 
So uh, I kind of blew that one entirely. I, I should have gone and and weighed in on the fame of Space 1999 when it was on air every night. Uh, it was, although it wasn't a huge success, it was popular enough for it to have made me a very viable young actor in America at the time. People wanted to see me and wanted to offer me work. So finally, um, I was doing a Dolphin Cove by CBS and Paramount. I was having my, my uh, I don't know, 40th birthday or something in Sydney. It was 18th of June, which is four days ago. And um, the people there were asking me what I was going to do with Dolphin Cove. And one of them was a girl that had a family living in America. And she said to me, well, you should go to America and talk to the producers because you're right at the, on the verge of, of network pickups. And uh, when the series are happening, they choose on the 21st and 22nd of June in America what shows are going to be picked up by network and what shows are going to be dropped. So she said, you need to be there now. And she knew a lot about it. And I said, oh, no, I'm not going. She said, well, you go and stay with my Auntie Betty. And I knew Auntie Betty because she was a, <laughs> lived around the corner from me when she'd been living in Australia. So she picked up my phone in the house and rang Auntie Betty in America on the 18th of June. And she said, you know, Nikki Tate. And she said, I love Nikki Tate. She said, can you come and sleep on your sofa for a week or two? He wants to come over and try out for pilot season. Oh, send him over. I'd love to have him, you know. So Di, this is Di Morrissey, incidentally, you know, Australia's famous author, authoress. Um, so... A new, I was offered a series in America when I came over. This is Dolphin Cove. Won't go again, but we'd like you to try out for various shows. And I tried out for several shows. I've got, got nice guest leads in Cheers and uh, Dear John and oh, a couple of other things. I remember they were now. But the pilot to a new television series, which was called Open House, and I got that. So I had to ring my wife and say, well, do you want the good news or the bad news? And she said, well, what's the bad news? I said, Dolphin Cove has been canceled, so I won't be doing it anymore and won't be going up to Queensland. She said, oh, thank God. So now you can be with us in Sydney. And I said, well, no, I've been offered another series. She said, well, it's not going to be in Queensland, is it? I said, no, no. Oh, thank God. I said, it's going to be in L.A. What? I said, yeah, sorry, sweetheart, but um, <laughs> I'm going to be going to L.A. You've got to be kidding me. I said, no, no. And we just built this lovely house in Mount Vale. I'd finished... Um, Cool and got a gold, and I spent all the money from that movie on refurbishing the house at Montevale. And so she thought we were there for life, and in fact, she's never forgiven me for it because we love Montevale, still to this day. Still got the house, thank God. Um, but there I was uh, in America, and she wouldn't come. So for nearly a year, I was doing the show over here alone, and she'd come and visit for about three days with the kids and then take them home in tears. and Or I'd fly to Sydney for about four days and be with everybody for a wonderful time at Mona Vale, and then everybody I would all be in tears. I'd fly back to the States. Eventually, she came to the States and said, all right, she'd stay. And we bought this house in the Palisades. And I remember I went to, a, I normally don't go to Aussie parties that are being held in, um, in LA. But um, Tony Bonner was over here, my old mate Tony. And he said, oh, Nick, he said, uh, go to a party on Saturday. He said, uh, do you want to come? I said, how do you get invited to an American? He said, oh, that's no, no, not an American party, mate. It's uh, um, Rod Hardy. His wife uh, was, was a lady that loved to throw parties. And she would throw Aussie parties with lots of directors and actors and writers that would come. And I, I'd heard about them. And I think I'd even been invited to a couple of them. But I never went because I wanted to work with Americans and just sort of parlaying with Australians all the time in America didn't seem to me to be advancing my career in any direction, so I didn't go to any of those parties. But I went to this one, and um, I'll tell you who was there. A very young Russell Crowe and uh, Hugh Jackman. Uh, they just arrived almost, I don't think they came together because they had their own relationships at the time, but they happened to arrive very much at the same time. Uh, and uh, everybody was talking about them. I didn't know who they were because I was working in America and uh, both um, Russell Crowe and um, Hugh Jackman. And they were both there and incredibly sort of um, wide-eyed and not naive isn't the right word, but I had no concept that both of them were kind of like 
going to be superstars. I didn't know who they were. I was introduced to them. I said, hello. They actually knew me better than, well, I had no clue who they were because they were doing good work in Australia at the time. And uh, I'd been working in America, so I had no knowledge of who they were. And um, there was a guy there who who spotted me. Uh, he was an old fella. And he came over to me and he said, so uh, how do you like the party? And I, and I said, oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's nice. He said, uh, you, uh, you live here somewhere in the States, don't you? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm down in Palisades. Oh, you must be doing okay. And I said, well, I've had a couple of series, you know, so you make money. And he said, yeah, but, you know, you're, uh, you do voiceovers, don't you? And I said, uh, not in America, I don't. He said, why don't you? And I said, uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I've got a voiceover reel and I have a voiceover agent, but they never call me. He said, but that's crazy. He said, you could be earning a million dollars with your voice. I said, oh, yeah, sure. Right. Uh, he said, no, I'm not, I'm not kidding. He said, I make movie trailers. I work with Don LaFontaine a lot. You know who he is? And I didn't know who he was. No, I don't. You don't know who Don is? I said, no. He said, well, you will. And he said, um, here's my card. I want you to give me a call. Come over to my house and we'll, we'll do some subs. Have you ever done any subs? And I said, I, I don't know. What's a sub? <laughs> you know, submissions for, for movie trailers. He said, I do a lot of them. So, uh, And a guy I used to work with all the time, sadly, uh, he passed away. So, uh, And you have a quality in your voice that's very like him. I need somebody like you, so I'm prepared to pay you a couple of hundred, maybe 300 a, a, a visit. You come on my house, cash in your hand. Is that okay? And I said, uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'd been earning several thousand doing the television series, so I wasn't really interested in doing voiceovers for a couple of hundred, really. I'm not being disingenuous. I, I literally didn't know who he was or what it was about. And um, and here's this my man promising I, I could make millions of dollars doing voiceovers. I didn't know anybody could make millions of dollars doing voiceovers. Um, so I didn't call him. And about, ooh, I suppose 10 days later, my phone rings and he says, geez, you're a hard man to track down. Oh, are you working? I said, excuse who is this? He said, oh, come on, don't shit me. You know who I am. Nobody sounds like me but me. Uh, I said, yeah, okay, I met you two weeks ago at the party. He said, absolutely. Are you working? I said, uh, no. Why not? I said, well, I haven't been out on anything recently. He said, would you like 300 bucks today? Um, doing what? He said, I, I got a, a script here I'd like you to read for me. I'll give you 300 bucks cash in hand, all right? I said, where are you? He said, uh, in Hollywood. He gave me his address. I said, I could be there. It was about 10 o'clock. I didn't want to sound too interested. I, I said, would three o'clock be? Yeah, could you come earlier? Uh, I Maybe 2.30. I got there at 2.30. He had this broken down old house living over the top of Universal Studios, actually right on top of that hill. And he was looking down in Universal Studios from his road. So I went there and um, he had all these old uh, recording machines and lots of monitors and stuff. And I mean, I've been in plenty of places like that. You know, but this was his home. And he was very well versed in it, all of it. And he had me read it a few times. And it was great, you know, and he loved it. And he said, uh, come and have a look at some stuff. Um, he played me some of Don LaFontaine stuff. And in some instances, it, he said, you could do this one. I said, well, what's the point? He's already done it. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, it's very, very hard to get a break in this town. He said, what I want to do, I've got the original tapes here. I'm going to lift his voice off, and I put your voice on there. Then I'm going to take it to a couple of big agents I know, and I'm going to say, do you know who this is? And they're going to hear you, and they're going to say, no, I don't know who it is, but we want him. And that is exactly what happened. I owe everything to Vincent Sklenner, who was this guy that picked me and said, you're going to make a million dollars with that. I've made several million dollars doing voiceovers, Be all because of Vince. Dear Vince, God bless him. You know, uh, I, I got very soon thereafter, he put me with Steve Tisherman, who had Don LaFontaine. So suddenly I'm not number two, but I'm, you know, in line to the great, voiceover man in America, the same agent. 
He introduced me to his agent. It was Steve Tishman. We all went out for a meal together. And then Steve said, I've listened to your reel. Um, you're, you're interesting. Um, do you play golf? And I said, uh, yeah. He said, I, I happen to have a fourth available suddenly, become available on Sunday. Do you want to play? Sure, okay. So I joined them on the Sunday. I played golf with them. And... Um, uh, I had a great time with these guys. They were, they were good fun. And everybody loved the game and played pretty well. And I, I didn't disgrace myself either by beating them or, or but it, just by, you know, staying level with them, which was great. I remember being on the 17th green just before we finished. And the other two voiceover guys have walked off to go and hit off the 18th. And he's not putting. He's hovering over this thing. And he looks up at me. He said, uh, Mr. Tate. And I said, uh, Yeah. He said, I listened to your reel again. I said, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, would you like to come in and sign papers with me tomorrow? I said, uh, yes, I would. Thank you very much. This was the god of, of agent voiceovers, man, you know, Steve yeah, Tishman. Yeah, yeah. He had all the best people. It took a while, about four months of, of kind of trying several things and he would say to me, Nick, you've got to cut through. You know, you, you tend to whisper too much. That's never going to work. And then I did Jurassic Park, and I whispered. <laughs> and they all went, oh, we love him. <laughs> he said, I'm going to, you can yeah, whisper exactly. all you like now, Nick, you know. I, because it's not whispering. It's just intimate, and it's, um, actually, the first thing I did for him was 1492. 1492, Conquest of Paradise. Yeah, you know, just beautiful music with um, Van Gallus. Uh, just the most wonderful film. I didn't know that I was good at mo doing movie trailers. I just thought that, you know, all voiceovers, well, this is a narration for um, an industrial area where people are digging for oil or whatever it is. And uh, that, I was becoming very much that sort of a voiceover guy that told the story of, of the narration of... of of the documentary, uh, and they weren't using me for American commercials. I've I've never really been used for American commercials. I would love to do commercials more, but I I've not gotten them. You know, movie trailers became the thing for yeah. me, and it was um, I love the storytelling quality of it. You know, a mystery or a comedy. Yeah. And for the longest while, they wouldn't give me any drama. Uh, I did. Well, I suppose Jurassic Park is not drama. It's just, it's magical. Um, uh, and it's not kid stuff and it's not adult stuff either. It's just kind of an in-between wonderful fantasy area. Uh, but then, you know, I would never have got something like Independence Day, the day we fight back. But I did. And that became huge for me too. So suddenly, Tishman had always said to me, stop whispering. Then, then I did stop for Independence Day. <laughs> So what's uh, life like now? So I, I like playing golf. I like being with my grandkids. I like building things at home. Uh, I play the stock market all the time. I'm having a ball. And occasionally I do voiceovers. Yep. And, and occasionally I do uh, an on-camera job. You know, I did uh, The Blacklist just over a year ago uh, in New York. I was asked to go and play a, an Irish villain in that and... Uh, some years before that, I did Lost. It's it's funny how some of these shows, uh, people said to me the other day, you were on Lost yesterday. I went, wait a minute. No, I did Lost 10 years ago or maybe 20 years ago. I can't even remember how long ago it was. But it's funny because yeah. in repeats, people will ring me up and say, just saw you on television. Did you know? You know, and whatever it was. I've done so many things. That's the beauty of, of, of residuals in this country, you know. Um, in England and Australia, the residual payments were not great. But uh, in America, actors live off their residuals. It's, um, yeah. it's an annuity that is, uh, it keeps giving. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, I got something the other day, and this is not much, but it was like $2 and $3 and 4 There was about 15 shows that I'd done 40 years ago, you know? My father was an actor and a voiceover guy. I think I might have mentioned this before, but he was one of the voices in, in Thunderbirds for the Anderson family. 
Jerry Anderson, Sylvia Anderson, yep. and my father was one of the ancillary voices. Because Ray Barrett were, and Charles Tingle, they were both permanent voices in the Thunderbirds as Australian actors. And they loved my dad. So when he came to England, they said to the Andersons, you got to use Johnny Tate. So he came along and he played lots of the, you know, the, the bad guys that come in or, oh, the, you know, the pilot from somewhere else. And, and so he, he had all kinds of guest spots that he did continually in that. And when he died, he left me his Thunderbird residuals, which I thought was a funny, quaint little thing to do. I get two, three hundred bucks a year from my father's voiceovers from Thunderbirds. And that's been for, yeah, yeah. Uh, I get maybe, I think every quarter, so four times a year. So I don't know when it will ever finish, if it will ever finish. This show was mixed by Voodoo Sound. Edit by Andrew Peters using Source Connect Now and Rode Microphones with technical support from George the Tech Whittem. Don't forget to subscribe and like us. Yeah.